Good morning. morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Thank you for joining us on this snowy Christmas Eve morning. We are glad you're here. Welcome to any guests that are visiting from out of town, visiting family for the holidays. Welcome back to our college students. And we have some special guys serving in our military around the world that are here on leave. So if you see short hair, a mustache, and big muscles, say hi to them and greet them and thank them for their service. I get it all the time, but... (laughs) And then welcome to just our faithful body here at Southside. Uh, It's good to be together to remember the coming of Christ, the advent of Christ, the one who saved us, who's joined us to him and joined us to each other. So we get together this morning to remember his advent as a family. And just a reminder that our candlelight Christmas Eve service will be right here at 445 this evening, right? 445. So please join us for that um, as we continue our celebration of the advent of Christ. Galatians 4.4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Son. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and sending him to redeem us. And in this season, we we focus on your mercy to us, the sacrifice of sending Christ. And I pray this morning as we enter into this text that your spirit would guide us into the truth of it, that your spirit would cause us to see Christ to find joy in Christ, to think about all redemptive history coming down to this moment when the baby would be born. God, bless our time this morning. Use it to encourage us, all the burdens that we carry. I pray that your word would minister to us. Your spirit would lift those burdens. I pray for those that don't know Christ, that they would consider this holiday season, this Christ who has come, They would give their lives to this Christ. God, bless our time in your word and in our worship to you in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. We have all been in a season that is both culturally engaging and spiritually profound. The Christmas season, it culminates tomorrow. It's inescapable in the American experience. You can love it. You can hate it. You can be drawn into it. You can fight to reject it. But you cannot ignore that it is here and it's going on all around us. Do what you want with the cultural side of things, but the message of Christmas remains. God is still calling us back to a manger 2,000 years ago in a stable where quietly and humbly And definitively, God visited us. Our culture would sum up Christmas in terms like family and friends, food, lights, gifts, with an ever-increasing Christlessness. But for believers in the Jesus of Christmas, we come to this season of remembering the coming of Christ, and we sum it up with words like prophetic fulfillment, advent, Emmanuel, incarnation, forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, eternal hope, inexpressible joy. Because this baby became a man and brought the gospel. Because Jesus is the gospel. The good news of salvation by grace through faith comes to the baby in the manger who willingly would ascend the cross three decades after his birth and give us the gift of all gifts, the gift of his very life in exchange for ours, for the forgiveness of our sins. This little baby in the manger and the events surrounding his birth 
are everything to us. We worship him for who he is, for how he came, that he came, what he did when he came, and the certainty, as we just heard, that he will come again. And so Christmas continues for us as Christians. It doesn't end tomorrow. We live in the daily reality of the advent of Jesus Christ. It's Christmas every day for Christians. We live our lives for him, in him, abiding in him. This first advent anticipates his second and final advent when he will come and set all things right forever and we will see him face to face. This morning, I want us to see in these two verses and the surrounding context, the glory of the sending of the Son, the beauty and the weight and the hope of the advent of Jesus Christ. Because our text is telling us first and foremost that God sent forth his Son. That's the essence of our text. He sent him at a certain time. He sent him in a certain way, in a certain form, into a certain circumstance. And he sent him for a glorious purpose, which our text unfolds in two statements, to redeem those under the law and to adopt us as sons and daughters. So our outline this morning, the glory of the sending of the Son, our first point will be the glorious timing of the sending. And then secondly, the glorious person who was sent. And thirdly, the glorious purpose in the sending. Our text is the pivotal argument in Galatians 4, 1 through 7. The argument that Paul has been making throughout chapter 3 as well. That faith in Christ frees us from the law. It doesn't lead us back under the law as the churches in Galatia were doing, were considering. Paul is refuting this error by explaining the relationship between the promise, which comes by faith, and the law, which served a purpose for a season in the fulfillment of that promise. Look with me in Galatians 3.21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In the timeline of redemptive history, God made a promise to Abraham. Then 430 years later, the law came. Then the promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and we are no longer under the old covenant law. And verse 26 of Galatians 3 makes an amazing statement that I think has everything to do with our text this morning. I'll pick it up in 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Why? Why can't we be under this tutor, the law? What has changed? 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Sons of God are not under law. This is so important to understand in the Christian life. Faith in Christ brings the forgiveness of our sins. It also brings a relationship with God in which we were brought into his family. Our text this morning addresses the pivotal moment that moved us from slavery to sonship, from law to sonship. And it is the very heart of Christmas. The coming of Christ changed everything. It made us children of God free from the law because law and relationship are not friends. The kind of life that God is offering all through the Bible is not simply conformity to a righteous standard, an external obedience. The life that Jesus brings is a life of holiness, but it is presented to us in the context of a relationship with God to know him, and to be his people, for him to be our God, to love him, and to believe his love for us. That is the goal of the gospel. 
When I think of law, I think of firm, objective standards. Tax law, civil law, mosaic law. None of these concepts warm my heart relationally. If you get pulled over by a police officer, he is not looking to begin a friendship with you. You've crossed some line of law and you're busted. That's the intent of the police officer, to bust you. You're most likely getting a ticket out of this experience and not a friend. If you get a letter in the mail that you're being audited and that you'll be working with an agent of the IRS, we don't jump up and down and say, I can't wait to meet them. A standard is being brought against you to expose you to reveal your errors. And I know it's an incomplete illustration, but I think parenting understands the difference between law and relationship. Think with me, if you're a parent, if you have a young four or five-year-old at the park, and they're playing on some playground equipment, and they're playing all over it, and they begin to ascend higher and higher beyond where you're comfortable. You begin with relational appeals first. Hey, buddy. Let's not go any higher. That's, that's high enough. Daddy doesn't want you to get hurt. Relationship is at the forefront of that parenting methodology. And to the extent that little Johnny ignores your warnings and climbs higher and higher until you are in an utter state of panic, the parenting style can move quickly from relational appeals to legal appeals, consequences, threats, firmness of tone, the Ten Commandments of Playground Experience. Get down now. Listen to me right now. Start climbing down this very second. And the appeals become distant and firm and objective. Relationship should motivate in those moments, but law must regulate. Keep this distinction of law proper as we look at our text. This distinction between law proper and relationship is at the heart of what we're digging into. In Galatians 4, 1 through 7, Paul is illustrating this distinction of purpose between law and promise through the timeline of a child growing up in a family who's supervised by guardians and managers. This was common practice in first century Greek and Roman culture. Servants that oversaw a child's schooling and discipline. My best guess culturally for us, nanny, an au pair, But then the child grows up and inherits his place in the family and in a moment is free from the guardians of childhood. And he steps into the freedom of adulthood and inheritance. Paul builds this analogy flowing out of Galatians 3.29. Look there with me. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. Now I say as long as the heir is a child... He does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. And then Paul concludes the argument of the analogy in verse 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Everything hinges in our text this morning in, the, in verses 4 and 5, what we're looking at this morning. The advent of Christ is the hinge to spiritually growing up and moving from slavery to sonship. In our analogy, the son moves progressively through slavery, slavery or, or guardians as a child. He's a minor. He hasn't inherited anything yet, and, and he looks just like everyone else all the other slaves, but he's not the same as they are. He's an heir. He actually owns everything. But in this season, as a child, he's still in bondage as a slave to the guardians. 
And then it all changes. He grows up and he's free. Paul's analogy is meant for us to see our slavery under the law and then our freedom from the law when we grow up. It's a spiritual coming of age. The Bible calls it salvation. When we become sons of God through faith in Christ and all of it hinges on the advent of Christ. God sent Christ, and Christ brings sonship, and sonship brings freedom from the law, and full inheritance and standing before God as his child. In the analogy, it all happens in a moment. Look in verse 2. It says, at the date set by the Father. Now, most societies have a coming-of-age moment, a declaration of adulthood. Sadly, we do not. It was 12 years old for the Jews, marked by the bar mitzvah ceremony, 18 for the Greeks. They had their own coming-of-age ceremony, around 16 for the Romans, at which time the man received his toga virilis, his toga of manhood. You could tell a man in Roman society by the way he dressed. It might be helpful in our society if there was a certain way of dressing that indicated that is a man. Paul then makes the comparison with us in verse 3. Look in Galatians 4, 3. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Before you and I were saved, we were slaves too. And it's, it's very important to define what these elemental things are. It's just very difficult. It, it's sort of a broad term, and it's used in different places, and every commentator seemed to have five or six options here. It has a root meaning of to set things in a row or to rank them. It signifies a foundation or, a foundational or a rudimentary orderliness. It, it carries the idea of basic things. It was used of the letters of the alphabet, the elemental building blocks of writing. Look at Galatians 4.9. He uses the same word in a little bit different way and seems to help us define in a, it in our context. I'll begin in 4.8. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Paul says, before you knew God, you were slaves to false gods in this world. And he calls these elemental things weak and worthless. So I don't think he's speaking directly of the law proper. But generally, it seems to be referring to the basic elements of human religion. Our own striving, a religion of self, under law or in a false religion, The hopeless slavery of self-effort, and we all know it well because we lived under it before we came to Christ. Sin at its essence is the exaltation of self in exchange for God as God, for God's glory. We think our own thoughts, we make our own rules, we justify our own failures. We live for ourselves and through ourselves. If you are trying to find peace with God this morning from within yourself, you are enslaved to the elementary, elemental things of this world. If you're striving to be God to yourself, you are enslaved to the elemental things of this world. If you're engaged in some sort of false religion, some sort of false self-help ideology, you are enslaved to the elemental things of this world. Paul says you can chase the right God the wrong way through old covenant law keeping, still human effort, or the wrong God the wrong way. False gods, but again, human effort. The end result is the same. You will never find freedom for your soul. It was into this helpless state of slavery slavery that God sent his son. The first point in our outline is the timing of the sending. Look in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time came, the glory of the sending of the Son is that Jesus came at just the right time. It was a perfect moment 
when we were slaves, when the fullness of time came that God sent his son. The word fullness, it means just what it means, to fill something up. Time filled up and Jesus came. It's the same word to describe the full baskets that were left over after the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. The baskets filled up with leftovers until they were full. It makes me think of a balloon filling until the moment it pops. The advent of Jesus Christ occurs at the fullness of the time and it pops and God sends him. The question then is, who filled up time? There's a wonderful theology of time here in Galatians 4.4. So I just want to step back and think about time for a moment. In our experience, time is like a river that we're all floating down. We live in it, but we can't stop it. We are wonderfully trapped in it, and we can't escape it. Yet we always want more of it, because once it's gone, it's gone forever. We can sense time, like the ticking of a clock keeping us awake at night. Or we can lose track of time, like a first date. Or a family vacation when an hour or a week just seems to evaporate in an instant. Time can seem to take on a personality of its own. Sometimes it's considered father time. It can seem to be its own force and authority, moving us forward from this moment to the next. It rolls on with such determination, and we're helpless to stop it. The beauty in our text is that time filling up is inseparably linked to God acting in time. Time serves God's purposes and never the reverse. Time is the river into which God unfolds his providence. It is the context into which his sovereign decree is revealed. And so who filled up time? God filled up time. God sent his son when he wanted to. For his glorious purposes, which means the sending of Christ into the world was not random. It was not haphazard or unplanned. It was not reactionary. It was purposed and precise. It was ordained in the mind of God to occur at that very moment. John Calvin says that the time which had been ordained by the providence of God was seasonable and fit. Therefore, the right time for the Son of God to be revealed to the world was for God alone to judge and determine. I I think that is a profound thought that God filled up time. Because all of this wonderfully means that God has a plan. No one is filling up God's time. He alone orders history. All of it is good and merciful and ordered It's his plan for his glory, and you and I need to hear that, and we need to believe that, especially here at Christmas. Why? Because our time can feel so unplanned. I was shopping yesterday, and a fight broke out between a man and a woman, not physically, just verbal. And I stood back, and I thought, I wonder if they're thinking right now, what's the point of all this? What's the point of just fighting shopping carts through Walmart to get some things. Life can feel like chaos going nowhere fast. Busy schedules seemingly without meaning, unbelievable stress without without a lot of clarity as to what it's all about. And add to that the chaos of the world at large, politics, the economy, suffering, wars, death, And it only adds to the confusion. We're living in this time, but somehow we never seem to find ultimate purpose and meaning in this time. The fact that God has a plan, that he's filling up time and accomplishing that plan means my time and your time is not meaningless. Because not only is he sovereign over the sending of his son, He is sovereign over every detail of our lives as well. Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Why? That they would seek God 
if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God ordains your time. God is sovereign over both the sending of Christ into the world and every moment of my life. And if you're willing to see the connection, your time and my time has great meaning and purpose, but only in relation to the time of Christ. There is hope for my time because God sent Jesus into our time to redeem sinners like us. And so please, don't live a meaningless life when God has sent forth his son in the fullness of time to save us and to give us meaning, his meaning and purpose in himself. Our second point is the glory of the sending of the Son in the person being sent. Verse 4, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. At the right time, God sent the right Savior. And there are three descriptions of Jesus in verse 4. He is Son, he is born of a woman, he is born under the law. We'll take the last two first. Born of a woman means that God sent his son, but Jesus was also Mary's son. Fully human, just like you and I. When the shepherds looked into the manger and what they saw was a human baby that had just been delivered by a human mother. And Jesus arrived into the ranks of humanity just like you and I, but without sin. Jesus would eat and sleep and was tempted by sin and experienced pain and suffering and joy and had friends and worked a job and had siblings and saw sunsets and wept when people died. There was nothing of our humanity that Jesus lacked. He was so human that Isaiah 53 says he perfectly blended in with other people. Isaiah 53 too. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Meaning he wasn't a model. He wasn't a superstar athlete. He had the appearance of, dare I say it, an average man like you and me. He didn't look like a king. The shepherds wouldn't have seen him and said, said yep, that, that looks like the Messiah. There, there he goes. That's, that's God. Far more likely and consistent with the Gospels is that people looked at Jesus and were surprised that he was the Messiah. They knew him as the son of Mary and Joseph with brothers growing up in Nazareth. He was shockingly human. The second qualifying description is that Jesus was born under the law. He was born a Jew under obligation to the law of Moses, just like everyone else. He was born under the law to live according to the standards of the law so that he might redeem those under the law. But he was not a slave under the law. He was the one to which the law pointed, the perfect one, because he was also God and perfect in every way. Our text says that Jesus was the Son of God. God sending forth his son is a statement of the son's deity. Jesus is not only fully human, he is also God himself, the second person of the Trinity. One commentator said the full implications of this text can hardly be grasped in human language. In sending Jesus, God did not send a substitute or a surrogate. He came himself. Listen to John 5, 17. There's so many beautiful passages in the Bible that declare the deity of Jesus Christ. And I'll just take this little part of John 5. But all surrounding this verse, these two verses we're going to read, are these incredible declarations of who Jesus was, what he knew, what he did, his relation to the Father. Listen to this, John 5, 17. But he answered them, my Father is working until now. And I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. It's why they killed him. It wouldn't have taken much for Jesus just to step back and be like, wait, wait, misunderstanding, guys. Hey, I'm just talking generically about being a son of God like everybody else here. 
He never did that. He declared that God was his father. He declared his deity by his works, by his words. Jesus is God. When Jesus came, God came to a sinful world to save sinful people. No one will ever make a journey like this again. From heaven to earth, from the beauty of the Trinitarian relationship to our little wrecked home here called earth. I love the innocence of a newborn baby. I don't mean moral innocence. We're all born sinners. I mean experiential innocence. As soon as they're born, they're looking around, wide-eyed, having just entered into life. We're staring at them and we're welcoming them into the world. We're looking in their face. Hi. Hi, buddy. It's a precious moment because they weren't and now they are. They didn't exist and then they do. And they know nothing about anything. They're seeing it all, hearing it all, experiencing it all for the very first time. That is not how Jesus came into this world. This was not his first experience. He's entering into his very own creation. Micah 5.2 says Jesus stepped out of eternity to be born in Bethlehem. John 1.11 says he came to his own, his own things. This was his universe. He created it. He sustains it. It sustains it. It's all his. And yet he came submissive as a baby into this world under the constraints of humanity, under the principles and restraints of a fallen world. The great divide that he was willing to cross was so vast to step down from the unimaginable glory and splendor of heaven, to enter into our cesspool of sin and godlessness. It was an infinite expression of love for his father who sent him and an infinite expression of love to those for whom he came to save. You and I might cringe at sleeping in a two-star hotel for a night because we all have our standards of lowliness, don't we? How low will we go for how long? Thankfully, Jesus did not. The glory of the incarnation is the humility of the Son to come from perfection to imperfection, from holiness to brokenness, from peace to chaos, from exaltation to humiliation, from the worship of the angels and being face to face with his Father to the sin and hatred and hypocrisy of our sinful world, wrecked by things like human trafficking and murder and war and homosexuality and abortion, and the list goes on. He came with full knowledge of both the awfulness of humanity and the coming awfulness of the cross. And yet God still sent forth his son. And Jesus still came to redeem us. He crossed that great divide. And these three descriptions speak to this one reality in our text. God sent forth a Savior that was qualified in every way to save. The Savior we needed, God sent. Galatians 4.4 reads like a divine resume for Messiah. And Jesus is the only one that meets the job qualifications and therefore is the only one that can save and is therefore the only one that we need to be saved. No one else can save you. In God's economy, nothing else can save you. God sent forth his son, Jesus, to redeem us. And so don't call a plumber when you need an electrician. Don't try to pay in euros when only U.S. dollars are accepted. Why? Why? Because a, a plumber is not well suited to do electrical work. And the euros aren't the currency accepted here. It's not going to go well at the checkout. And so for all human beings, we need to call on the one who is well suited to save. Of all the people and religions and worldviews offering you life, Jesus Christ is the only one suitable to save. Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The glory of the person, Jesus Christ, is then tied to the function for which he came. Our third and final point 
is the purpose of the sending of the Son. Galatians 4, 5. <clears throat> so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. The glory of the sending of the Son is seen in the stated purpose for which he was sent. He was sent to redeem by dying on a cross and through that redemption to adopt as sons and daughters all who look to him by faith. People for centuries have attributed all kinds of reasons for Christ's coming. He came as a good example. He came as a good teacher. He came as a rebel against religious elitism. But the text tells us in two simple and very clear statements precisely why God sent Jesus. The first being to redeem those under the law. To redeem is to purchase, to buy back from. Who was he buying back from? He was buying from God himself. The debt we owe is to a holy God. We owe him righteousness, a perfection that is our intended design and that is our corporate failure. The just punishment, if that debt goes unpaid, is eternity in hell. And the price of redemption to save us from that hell is the very life of the Son of God broken and poured out for us at the cross, his life in exchange for ours. The second reason given is so that those whom Christ redeems would receive the adoption as sons and be brought into God's family, <clears throat> to be brought into his kingdom with all the rights and the privileges and the relationship of Jesus, the Son. God sent his Son to make us sons and daughters. These are not small purposes and they are not small results. The only way you and I can be forgiven of our sin and have peace with the Holy God is through the death of God's Son. That is an immense sacrifice for our good. Let me summarize it this way. At the right time, when we were desperately in need of help, when you and I were under the law and we needed redemption, when we needed a relationship with the God who made us, that God came for us. God sent Christ because we needed Christ. He came for us because we were lost and condemned and enslaved to that sin. That's when God came for us. Each of our lives has been an endless roller coaster of people coming for us and sometimes, sadly, not coming for us. And each of us have had profound experiences, I hope, when someone suddenly, unexpectedly came for us. Someone showed up on the side of the road to help fix a tire in the rain. Something happens at home and you called 911 and the police or the ambulance, they showed up just when you needed them. People have shown up for me all my life. When I, was a, when I was born into this world, both my parents showed up. I know it sounds strange, but they were there when I knew nothing and needed everything. And they came for me every day of my life until they passed. They showed up at my sports games, my doctor's appointments, my graduations, my wedding, the birth of my children to help me and to bless me. Parents may be the greatest picture of someone coming for us in our time of need, or they may be the greatest sadness of someone who didn't show up in our time of need. <clears throat> my wife has showed up for me every day of our marriage. My kids have come for me and pursued me in love. The greatest memories of life are those moments of great need, and then someone shows up. And yet no one has come for me like our God has. He sent his son to die for me. Christmas is the greatest reminder, the clearest and purest testimony that no matter who has shown up for you in this life or who has not shown up for you, the advent of Jesus Christ is God's resounding declaration that he came. He came to do you good. The advent of Jesus Christ into this broken world, world is the final word on this topic 
when we were slaves to the elemental things of this world and the law had shut us up without hope, our God came for us. That is the message of Christmas. Our greatest need, God's greatest provision. Thousands of years of prophetic anticipation, the darkness of a fallen world. And then in the fullness of time, the light breaks in and there he was. The baby in the manger and hope had come. Salvation had come. Even if everyone has let you down in this life, and when you needed it most, no one showed up. Hear the message of the Advent. God came for you. God came for you, and that means everything in this life and the next. But what will you do with this Christ? God sent him to save you. He's willing to save you. He's qualified to save you. But what will you do with him? Most people will not have him. Most people will not have Christ. They will not believe in him. They will not receive him by faith. Will you? Our text goes on in Galatians 4 in verse 6 to explain just what God is after in redeeming people to himself. Look with me in Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. God didn't just send Jesus into the world. He sent the spirit of his son into our hearts to confirm the relationship we gain when we look to Christ for salvation. He is the spirit that cries out within us, Abba, Father, Papa, Dad. These two words are meant to affirm to us that in Christ, you and God are close now. And he loves you. There's a warm relationship between us of love and affection and family identity. You may have had a, a, a similar term for your dad. I grew up calling my dad Pops, and it means exactly this. What's up, Pops? 20 years later, 50 years old, hey, Pops, because we're close, because he's my dad. This is exactly what salvation brings and what God desires and what the Spirit of Christ testifies within us. You're not a slave anymore. You're not a slave to the law. You're not in bondage to self to exalt yourself and make up your own religion. You're a child of God and you're forgiven. And God is now your Father and you don't have to be afraid anymore because there is peace between us and the Spirit testifies that the one who made peace is Abba, Father. You have all of heaven on your side. Not just the infinite power of God, but the tender mercy of God and the unbreakable love of God in Christ. If you're not a Christian, believe that. Drink that up. What you have been looking for all your life, God has provided in Christ and the Advent opens the door for us to know God. He sent him at Christmas. And he alone can transform your life in an instant if you will only trust him. And so hear the message of Christ. As Jesus himself calls us to believe the gospel in light of his own Advent. John 5.24 says it so perfectly. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and has not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Christians, take it all in once again this Christmas season. We've been redeemed. We're not slaves. So stop putting yourself under the law to measure up. The time of law has come and gone by God's good design. Law is not for sons and daughters. Freedom is our status now. Freedom to know God and to love God and be loved by God. 
and to obey Christ because we love him, because he paid our debt in full forever. Enjoy your Christmas as sons and daughters of God who need nothing because we already have everything in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was to the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's pray. God, we come again this season and hopefully every day of our lives rejoicing that in the fullness of time you sent forth your Son to redeem and to adopt. God, may we embrace that fully by faith and receive all the blessing of the promise. Not just, not just a judicial stance of forgiven, but a nearness and a closeness to a God who loves us dearly as sons and daughters in Christ. God, thank you for your love for us, your great sacrifice of your son. May we now live in that love, walking according to your spirit and rejoicing that we are sons and daughters of the living God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.